This video is part of the Commercial Building Electrical Design Series, uh, the Power Distribution Design section. We're going to start looking at branch circuits today. First ones we want to look at are what are considered continuous loads, and these are for circuits uh, such as lighting and other uh, continuous loads. So here's where we are in the progression in this series. So we've covered uh, delivery systems, we've looked at materials, and now we're starting to look at branch circuits. And there's several different types that we want to look at moving forward. So now that we've reviewed some of the basic materials used for distributing power, we'll now focus our attention on some of the basic elements of power distribution systems. The most basic element in this system is the branch circuit. So this is the circuit that distributes power from our system to an individual load. In general, the branch circuit is usually derived in a branch circuit panel from a branch circuit breaker. We will now examine some of the different types of branch circuits and how these circuits are sized. The first type of branch circuits that we'll address here is the circuits feeding continuous loads. So by definition, uh, from the National Electrical Code, a continuous load is any load that is expected to be energized for three hours or more at a time. So the most common continuous load we have is lighting circuits. Usually when you turn the lights on in an office building, they're usually on most for pretty much most of the day, which would be at least eight hours if not more. So these are circuits uh, that feed the lighting in and around a building or facility. Before any circuiting of the lights can take place, the lighting layout must be complete for the entire facility, including fixture types, locations, and quantities for each room or area. We'll look at this in more detail uh, later in the lighting section of this series, but for now we'll assume that the lighting layouts are complete. So the first thing to consider when circuiting lights or lighting systems is what are, is what are the voltage requirements and what sources are available. Some thoughts should have been already given to this as the lights were being specified and laid out. So the two most common lighting voltages are 120 volts, which is typically supplied from a 12208 system, or 277 volts supplied from a 277480 system. The reason for using these two voltages is that for these <coughs> two distribution systems, there are voltages between one of the phase conductors and the neutral. This being the case, these circuits will only require a single pole breaker and or switch, which is in general much more practical than using multiple pole devices. Typically, smaller projects will only have 120 volts available, while larger projects will have 120 volts and 277 volts available to the designer. In general, the highest voltage available should be utilized whenever possible. The reason for this is that when the higher voltage is used, more fixtures can be placed on each circuit thus minimizing the number of circuit breakers required, and it can help minimize the effects of voltage drop on the circuit. <clears throat> there are a couple of exceptions to this philosophy. The first is in relation to incandescent fixtures, especially if you intend to dim them. In general, incandescent fixtures are inherently 120 volt fixtures. They can be specified to operate at higher voltages, but this usually requires the addition of a small transformer to step the voltage down to 120 volts. While in general this option is plausible, it can become more of an issue if dimming is desired. More often than not, when dimming an incandescent fixture through a transformer, this can generate a significant amount of unwanted noise and harmonics. One or two fixtures may not be that much of an issue, but if you start to dim an entire room, this can add up fast and cause a problem. Because of this, it is generally considered better design practice to just use 120 volts in lieu of a higher voltage to alleviate this problem. Another exception to using 120 volts or 277 volts for lighting is in, case, in the case of lighting a large open area such as a warehouse or gymnasium or exterior area, areas such as parking lots. This typically requires the use of HID lighting with wattages in the range of 400 watts or more. If there are a large number of fixtures of this type to be circuited and or spread or spacing of these fixtures is large, greater than 100 feet, then an even higher voltage may be need to be utilized. In such cases as these, the designer may wish to utilize the phase-to-phase -phase voltage, which means the circuits will require two pole circuit breakers or, and or switches. The voltages in these cases will be either 208 volts or 480 volts, respectively. The advantage of doing this is, again, that the design can be 
can have additional fixtures per circuit and or this will help alleviate any issues with voltage drop due to the length of the circuit runs. No matter what the voltage is used, the designer should always be conscientious, conscientious of the length of the circuit run required for the lighting and the effects of the voltage drop. If the length of the circuit is extreme, which is common on exterior lighting, the designer needs to do some voltage drop calculations and possibly increase the wire size as necessary to ensure that the voltage drop seen by the light fixtures is well within the acceptable limits. So the next thing to consider when circuiting light fixtures is how the fixtures are going to be controlled. This is important because the grouping of the fixtures for the switching needs to be coordinated with the circuit grouping. It is generally considered a bad design practice to unnecessarily divide the switch groups for different areas across different circuits. This can also cause challenges for more simple switching scenarios, such as for smaller rooms that are generally controlled by a single pole switch. If the fixtures in the room are fed from two different circuits, then the fixtures cannot be switched with one switch. For larger areas or exterior applications, lighting contactors are typically utilized to give the capability to control multiple circuits of fixtures at one time. We'll discuss this in more detail later, but this is a, a picture of what a lighting contactor looks like. So you can see here, you could run up to six circuits in here, and these will be the outputs to those lighting circuits uh, to feed the lights. And so we can control this with a, with a, a single pole switch or an electric uh, impulse or, or signal from a building automation system or something like that. So now that we've chosen the voltages and the corresponding sources that are going to be going to feed our lights, uh, and we have given some thought to how the fixtures are to be grouped and switched and controlled, it's now time to circuit the fixtures. So as discussed previously, the lighting circuits are typically fed with single pole 20 amp circuits or breakers utilizing number 12 wire. So the first thing we need to do is to determine how many fixtures we can put on a circuit. This is determined by first calculating the maximum load we can assign to a single circuit. As already stated, the National Electrical Code defines a continuous load as any load that is expected to be on or energized for three or more hours continuously at a time. In most circumstances, we can expect that our lights will be on for most of the day and or night, so they would typically be classified as continuous loads as defined by the National Electrical Code. This is important because the National Electrical Code states that these types of circuits can only be loaded to 80% of the rating of the circuit breaker. Assuming that we are using 20 amp breakers, which is almost always the case, with some exceptions that we might discuss later, we will need to derate the amount of load we can assign to these breakers by 80%. So, illustrated here, if we have a 20 amp breaker and we're derating to 80%, that means 16 amps is the maximum total load we can put on this circuit. Even though this is technically allowed by code, it's not necessarily considered a good design practice to load our circuits to the maximum amount of 16 amps. Uh, you'll hear me say this often, the National Electrical Code is not a design guide, it's just the bare minimum. Um, so it is considered good design practice to allow another 20% spare capacity on our lighting circuits. This is for a couple of reasons. The first is that even though our lighting layout may seem complete, more often than not, there will be changes during and possibly after the circuiting process. If the architect or owner comes back to you uh, as the designer and requests that an additional fixture or fixtures be added in a particular area, and we have loaded the circuits to the maximum, we would then have to supply an additional circuit to supply these added fixtures. This could prove to be problematic for a number of reasons. Another reason to allow spare capacity on our lighting circuits is after the project is complete, many times the owner will in the future either change out the lights in the area or, as before, want to add additional lights in the area for one reason or another. Again, if the designer has allowed spare capacities, these additions can be added rather simply. <clears throat> so let's take a look at this then. 20 amps times 80% is the 16 amps max total load per circuit per the National Electrical Code. Uh, if we take another 80% of that, that gives us 12.8 amps max total load per circuit, which is considered good design practice. So this is code, minimum by code, this is considered good design practice. So depending on the voltage of the circuit utilized for the lights, the maximum load in watts translates to the following. 
So if we're dealing with 120 volt circuits, we say 12.8 amps times 120 volts. That means we can put a little over 1500 watts on a circuit. If we're utilizing 277 volts, then likewise we do 12.8 amps, 277 volts. Now we can put almost a little over 3500 watts on a circuit. So as you can see, uh, we really pretty much uh, just about doubled the amount of circuits we can put on this fixtures we can put on a circuit. So looking at this, it should be apparent from the above calculations that more fixtures can be fed from a single 277 volt circuit than a 120 volt circuit. Again, over two times as many. So this demonstrates one of the points made earlier about always trying to utilize the highest voltage possible to reduce the number of circuits needed. So assuming we have a general light layout for the project with fixture types selected, we can now utilize this information to determine what the minimum number of circuits needed are uh, to circuit the lights. We should be able to take the quantity of each fixture type, multiply this by the total load given for each fixture type, and then add the total of these numbers to give us the total lighting load for the facility. We can then take the number of watts per circuit calculated above for the given voltage and divide the total load by this number. The results will be the minimum total number of circuits needed to completely circuit the lights. So let's look at a pretty simple example on the next slide. So here we've got a facility and we've laid out the lights and we've got different types of fixtures, type A, type B, and type C. So there's 20 of the type A's, five of the type B's, and three of the type C's. <clears throat> We look on the cut sheets for these fixtures and we see that a type A fixture uh, requires 110 watts, the type B 220 watts, and the type C is 100 watts. So now we can take the quantity, which is in the first paragraph up here, times the load, second paragraph, and multiply this out. And so this gives us the total wattage in the facility for each fixture type. So now we simply just add these up and we see we need a total of 3,600 watts for all the lighting in our facility. So it's probably a little small retail space or something like that. This isn't a lot of lighting. So with this, we can determine what the minimum number of circuits is. If we say have 120 volts available to us, we say 3,600 divided by the 1536, which we determined previously, and we see, we divide that out 2.34. Of course, you can't have a fractional circuit. It's got to be an integer number, so we have to round up to the next size. So we need at least three circuits to circuit all the lighting in this area. Uh, if we have 277 volts available, same thing. We've got 3,600 watts, but this time we divide by 3,500 watts, roughly. And in this case, we get 1.02, which is pretty close to one, but again, if we round up, we need at least two circuits minimum. So you can see by going to 277 volts, we've saved ourselves a circuit, which in this case is not a big deal because this isn't a tremendous amount of lighting, but if you get in really large facilities, uh, this starts to become a bigger and bigger factor and the 277 volts can, can really pay off. So looking at this a little closer, uh, in this example, Using the criteria defined above, we see that if we use 120 volt circuits, we will need a minimum of three circuits. And again, at 277, we need two circuits. But in this special case above, in the 277 scenario, when we are just barely over the limit, it may be acceptable, acceptable to use only one circuit in this case. Remember, we've got a 20% on top of another 20% buffer zone here. So that, you know, we could make that instead of 20% make it 18% or something, that's still okay. So if this were done, then we would have a circuit that has a load of 13 amps instead of the 12.8, which is like I said, is 81.2% of the maximum 16 amps. Uh, in this case, it seems uh, to make more sense than to use one circuit. So we would still have three amps of contingency left in the circuit, which should be plenty. So, here we want to look at, we've seen before if we use 120 and 277 volts, but remember when we said when we're using very large areas, like a super large warehouse, or if we're doing a lot of parking lot lighting or something like that, we might want to utilize the phase-to-phase -phase voltages. So you can see here, 
uh, if we use the phase-to-phase -phase voltages with our 12.8 good design practice limit, then for 208 volts, we can put a little over 2600 watts, which is much better than the 1500 watts uh, in a 12208 system. Or if we have 480 volts available, we could put over 6000 watts uh, per, per circuit. So um, again, that adds up pretty quick. It can save you some circuits and it definitely helps with voltage drop if you're running your circuits a long distance.